Here's a startling statistic. We've only explored 3% of the world beneath the waves. We know less about our inner space than we do about our outer space. And David Gallo tells me that that is in fact where we'll find the highest mountains, the deepest valleys, and this is a shocker, underwater rivers, waterfalls, and lakes. These are lakes under the ocean. Holy cow. David Gallo, come there. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Moses. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, what I'd like to do today is I want to take you on a quick trip around this wonderful planet and point out some of the things that, uh, that really fascinate me. Now, that's, as I said, you're looking at about, oh, 10,000 kilometers across that world right there, and you can hardly see any continent at all. If we zoom in, there's, there's the island of Hawaii. Now, Mauna Kea on the Big Island, that's actually the largest mountain on Earth if you drain away the ocean. Largest mountain on Earth, okay, higher than Mount Everest above the seafloor. These things, these things that criss crisscross the ocean, those are called fracture zones. Uh, they're many, many times wider than the Grand Canyon, thousands of times longer than the Grand Canyon. Uh, all these little dots that you see, these little pimples and whatnot, uh, those are uh, underwater volcanoes. And uh, each one of them a seamount. And in fact, Hawaii, the island of Hawaii, these are the islands that we know and love. But if you can actually go underwater and follow that mountain range across the Pacific Ocean, it takes a turn here and heads up that way under the Aleutian Islands. Okay, right here on that turn, it's about uh, 30 million years ago, that means a shift in the plate motion. That's exactly when the San Andreas Fault starts over in North America. So these clues to the Earth, the Earth is a wonderful planet. I mean, you can really start to put it together. For, the plate tectonics works, works great. All these volcanoes that you see, these little, these little punctuation points on the planet, we're finding each one of them has got their own little ecosystem. They're really fascinating, something we never thought about. We know the coral reefs up in shallow water, but as you go deeper, we call it the twilight zone, then deeper still into the dark. There's different ecosystems there. They're all very fascinating places. We're gonna go further to the west in the Pacific. Uh, I said the average depth of the ocean is about 4,000 meters. Uh, this here is the Marianas tr Trench right here. That's the deepest place on the ocean. That goes down to about 11,000 meters. And it was visited uh, once uh, by Don Walsh and Jacques Picard some years ago in the 60s in a submarine, but only last week a team came back to Woods Hole. We sent a robot to the bottom of that trench and we're gonna start investigating that trench in earnest all the way down to 11,000 meters. Now that's about the height that a jetliner travels when you see that vapor trail behind the back. So that's huge, incredible depths uh, and incredible pressure, about a thousand atmospheric pressures to get down to the bottom of that trench. Uh, we expect that we're going to find life there. Uh, for, uh, one thing that we've learned for about this planet is every time we think we're not going to find life, we find abundant life. Okay? Back here, there's all sorts of volcanoes. Down here and along the trench that goes down toward New Zealand, the Kermadec Trench, Lao Basin, we're looking at this. Right today, there are teams out there looking at underwater uh, volcanoes that are going on right, right today. Uh, back to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, so uh, we're over here. Uh, right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a mountain range, okay? And actually, it's in, it's in every ocean. It's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. This is the mountain range that got me interested in all this, that hand-drawn photo. And uh, it's the greatest mountain range on Earth, 70,000 kilometers long. It's like the seams of a baseball. And uh, crisscrossed by, again, thousands of those things called fracture zones that I said were many times wider than the Grand Canyon. So we've got the tallest mountain on Earth, Mauna Kea the greatest mountain range on Earth, 70,000 miles long, Mid-Ocean mid Ridge, the greatest valleys on Earth, those the things called fracture zones. And uh, right along the top of that Mid-Ocean Ridge, there's a valley, you can barely make it out here, okay? But down inside that valley, so the mountain range comes up and then there's a steep valley on top. In that valley, constant volcanoes and earthquakes. And when it was first visited, actually we were on the moon in, what was it, 69? It was five years later that we first visited this underwater mountain range. In a world that we thought was too, too deep, too dense uh, in terms of water, uh, all sorts of poisonous fluids coming out of the bottom, constant earthquakes, volcanoes, we said there shouldn't be any life there at all. And we find there abundant life in diversity, numbers of animals, density, uh, numbers, uh, amount of animals in one spot. It rivals the tropical rainforest. We were wrong about life on this planet. You don't always have to have sunlight for life on this planet. All of that life along this mountain range is living on chemical energies coming from the inside of the Earth out. Okay? So it totally revolutionized. And actually, it was never predicted. 
It was stumbled on by geologists that were looking at volcanic rocks. So incredible mountain range, and actually all along the top of that mountain range, it's m much higher than the Alps. Okay, many, many peaks, tens of thousands of them higher than the peaks in the Alps. If we go a little bit further south, this is the equatorial region, Brazil, Africa, here's that mountain range. It gets a little bit more rugged down inside here. Right here is the, the impact area roughly for Air France 447. Okay, so that left uh, Rio heading this way. And the last we knew, I'm gonna show you a zoom in on that area, uh, is that it's someplace inside that area, and there's a team out there right now, a French team, very capable French team, uh, looking for that, and some with help from other nations, looking for those, uh, those uh, flight recorders, listening for a pinger. Tough thing to do. Uh, in a way, we say it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. In this case, we don't know exactly where the haystack, which haystack we're looking at, nor do we know about that needle. It could be broken up into several pieces. We're going to go further to the north in the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, we call them currents, like the Gulf Stream, but actually they're rivers in the sea. And the shallow water ones are warm because they're buoyant, so they stay on the top of the ocean. But in some cases, like the Gulf Stream, it comes up to the Atlantic, it dumps its heat over here next to Europe. That keeps, uh, because of the humidity, keeps Europe nice and toasty. If you think about what northern Labrador is right across the Atlantic, okay, compare that to the Green Island of, of uh, Ireland. You know, southwest Ireland, pretty nice compared to what can grow over here in Labrador. Anyway, that current comes up to the north, dumps its heat, turns around, and it comes back very dense, cold, and deep. C comes across the bottom of the ocean, and right here off the west coast of Iceland, right there, the greatest waterfall on the planet. And I can't show it to you because it's, it's hard to see something that big underwater, but it's about five times higher than Angel Falls. And it's got the volume of tens of Amazon rivers flowing over the top of that, that underwater uh, uh, waterfall right there. When we come back. Now here's the flip side of it, is that no matter, well, I said no matter where we live, the oceans impact us. Well, no matter where we live, we impact the ocean. It's not just the coastal cities. It's the stuff that goes on our fields, our farmlands, our golf courses, uh, whether you're in the middle of North America, the middle of Africa, or the middle of Asia. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. I'm going to go again further to the east and look at uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, it's a great ocean for a couple of reasons. One is that it's uh, the only way out, to the, except for the Suez Canal, uh, which is man-made, is through the Straits of Gibraltar right there. And there are times when that doesn't open to the open ocean, so that water can flow back and forth. And when that happens, if it happens long enough, all this dries up completely. You could walk from Italy right across to Africa. When it does that, it leaves behind huge layers of salt. And then when the ocean pours back in, those layers of salt, when we go into the Mediterranean, and the same thing in the Gulf of Mexico, you do find these lakes beneath the sea. They're phenomenal. I, I encourage you to go on the web. Look, they're called brine pools. You'll see some amazing new images. I looked at some new ones yesterday, and I made my jaw drop open. It looks just like a lake up here under the, uh, under the sun, except it's at the very bottom of the sea. There's waves in it. They're so dense that the submarine can't sink in it, but it can float on top of it. And there's all sorts of animals that come down to the edges of these underwater lakes and feed along the edges of those lakes. Um, I want to show you this because this I find very interesting. This is India. India used to be down here against Africa. And about 50 million years ago or so, when flying to the north, uh, this is on, it's blinking for some reason, when flying to the north, smashed into Asia, and, and up came the Himalayas. They're still actually going up because India is still pushing northward. It actually hit so hard, it cracked the continent right here, Lake Baikal. 20% of the world's fresh water is right there in that one lake because it's so deep, Lake Baikal. All right, so here's the deal. Seven billion people living on this planet. And, you know, uh, most of us, about half of that seven billion, live pretty close to the coast, in the coastal zone. And they're, we're affected by hurricanes, tsunamis, things like red tide, ocean storms. Uh, floods and droughts, uh, stuff like that. But no matter where you live on this planet, this is something that needs to, th to sink in, the oceans impact your everyday life. Um, climate change is one way it certainly does it. I mean, your climate here is controlled a lot by what goes on in the Western Pacific, a little bit from the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, this is from the IPCC. It's some of the things going on with climate. You know, we're living climate change right now. It's not something we're trying to avoid. We're living with it now, so we need to learn how to deal with it. 
And some of those things Maud talked about, if nothing changed, we'd be in big trouble and have to act, take action right now. But everything's changing pretty quickly. And just a recent report came out in the last couple of days that's truly scary about the impacts of climate change. Uh, here's the graph that really set things off, and it's called the hockey, the hockey stick. This is, of course, the stick, the blade here. Uh, this is the past, it goes back about 1,000 years. Uh, that's old data. Uh, this is the, the present, just this, this gray bit right here, that's a real good measurement. But you see the trend, this is temperature, is generally up. And all this stuff right there on the right, that's what's predicted. We need to know what's coming next. But you see there's a wide discrepancy right there in what the predictions are. That's because we know very little about the oceans. And the oceans are, are pretty much the engine that drives climate change. Climate's about two things, temperature and precipitation. How hot, how cold is it? Is it gonna rain, gonna snow, flood, drought? Okay, and when you look at the ocean, I'd like to show this image. Uh, this is the Earth looking at water vapor from, this is 1995, so it's old data from, from uh, NASA. But what it shows to me is a connected Earth. Even when there's a blue sky out there, there's still water vapor moving around this planet. And uh, it shows these patterns, and it actually makes you feel a little bit sorry for meteorologists, weathermen, when you look at something like this, because they've got to try to predict what's coming next. And you know, this is, this is amazing, because it really does control where it rains and where it doesn't rain, where the floods and droughts are. Uh, it's all wrapped up in that pattern. And a lot of it's in the atmosphere, but this is what's going on beneath the atmosphere. This, this is ocean water, red being hot, blue being cold. We're over inside here. Uh, this red water coming, hot water coming across the Atlantic, up the East Coast. There's the Gulf Stream right there. There's the light blue making Europe nice and toasty. Here's that little bit of uh, heat coming up here that really does make a big difference to the European, and actually all the way across Europe into Asia, climate, the Gulf Stream right there. Um, we get at the past, and we're getting better at this, by going, looking at cores, uh, tree rings, um, ice cores, uh, and corals, uh, and sediments. We can get at the past. The future is gonna be about new technologies, robots and things like that, whole suites of new technologies. This is the robot we sent to the bottom of the trench. Uh, eventually we're gonna have satellite links, so the, the ocean will become much like we look at the atmosphere. Um, now here's the flip side of it, is that no matter, well, I said no matter where we live, the oceans impact us. Well, no matter where we live, we impact the ocean. It's not just the coastal cities. It's the stuff that goes on our fields, our farmlands, our golf courses, uh, whether you're in the middle of North America, the middle of Africa, or the middle of Asia. All that stuff, herbicides, pesticides, um, fertilizers, eventually gets into our rivers, our streams, our groundwater, and makes its way to the sea, and that stuff is deadly. It's a silent killer. Uh, dead zones right now are popping up all around the sea. And these are horrible things, and we have no idea yet what the full extent is or how we recover from these. Okay, it's not the big events. It's not the things the media picks up on, the oil spills where you've got the ship there, the, the dead uh, animals on the beach, the, uh, the rocks soaked in oil. It's that slow trickle of us, of humanity, of seven billion of us out into the sea that's really doing an incredible job at changing the chemistry of the seawater. The second thing is, is that the ocean chemistry is changing through acidity. Okay, the oceans absorb about 30% of the carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. That turns into carbonic acid. So animals that live in the ocean that try to make their shells uh, or their, their skeletons out of seawater are having a harder time doing that. So, and, and anyone that's ever had an aquarium knows if you fiddle with the temperature, oceans are getting warmer, fiddle with the chemistry, uh, all the stuff we're dumping in on the acidity, uh, you know that stuff is going to change and it's changing for the worse and it's changing on a global scale and quickly. When we come back. For us to work the way we do, you've got to take that little bit of fresh water and sprinkle it in just the right places at just the right times and just the right amounts or we don't survive. Okay, we collapse. The history shown that to be the case. Great ideas are meant to be shared. Join the discussion on Facebook. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. This is the Earth at night. And uh, at nighttime, in fact, this is from a company that used to be here in Toronto, uh, some of it still is, WorldSat International. I love this image. Uh, four, uh, four different kinds of lights on here. Uh, these, the white lights of the civilized, well, I shouldn't civilize, bad word, the de developed world, the world that really relies on electricity. Okay, actually, let's get closer and take a look. There's North America right here. So we're right about, uh, where are we here? We're right about here. Um, okay, 
And then uh, there's Europe. You can see Europe nicely outlined in white lights. This is the North Sea. These red dots, the brightest things from space, those are gas flares on the top of, uh, of uh, oil, oil, oil rigs and platforms. Uh, here's some, so that's uh, Siberia, Persian Gulf. This white here, one of the most populated places on Earth, is the Nile River. Um, when you go f further to the east, the blue dots, uh, those are fishing fleets. And they're almost like, here's Japan sitting right here, here's Korea sitting right there. Zoom in, look at that. That's the next whammy that we have. You know, we talked about an assault earlier, we heard about assault on the vulnerable. You know, the animals on this planet don't stand a chance against us. And we are assaulting them in the most vicious way, almost like we're waging war on nat nature. Now you can argue, well, we didn't know. And maybe we can say that for the past, but now we do know, so now we need to change. Okay, but those are fishing fleets, and the, the state of fisheries in the globe right now is pretty frightening. About 70% of the big fish pretty much wiped out. We're not really sure how to, how to uh, what helps that recover, but it's something that we need to uh, get on pretty quickly. I was marveling today at my hotel that uh, Chilean sea bass, that's a real no-no, is on the menu, on the uh, restaurant menu. Oop. Um, the last kind of light, these are the gold dots. Those are open, uh, those are village fires. Okay, there's Africa. There's a Sahara sitting right there. Uh, the gold dots, those are all village fires. You know, now, this goes back to what Maud was saying. Uh, there's about a billion and a half people, maybe more, on this planet that this stuff is precious to, this fresh water, clean water. Uh, people that walk miles and miles to come back with a jug of water that they know will make their family sick and maybe kill some of them. How can that be on a planet that I said in the beginning, planet ocean, 70% covered with water? It doesn't seem to make sense. Oh, let's go, let's go back to this again. Um, this is the present day again right over here. Uh, this is that bit in the past that we say was relatively stable. You know, here's the industrial revolutions over here. This was pretty stable climate. Well, let's take a look again further in the past. This is that flat stretch. Now we're looking back 10,000 years. Stable climate right here, okay, in terms of temperature. Every place I put a red dot, that's a society that collapsed, the big one. The Harappa, the Akkadians, the Moche, the Anasazi, uh, the Maya, all of those societies collapsed. And when you look in detail, what we're being told now is they collapsed not because so much of warfare, but because of changes, slight changes in the climate and in their availability to get fresh water. Um, we started out by saying planet ocean, a lot of water on the earth, but think about this. We wondered how much water is there really? 10,000 kilometers across, four kilometers deep. I said that's a lot of water, you can't scuba dive to the bottom of that, you have to have pretty advanced technology. But four down by 10,000 across, how much water is that? That's skinner than the, than the film on an, uh, the skin of it, uh, thinner than the skin on an apple. So we took the water off the planet, and uh, here's the earth right here. This is all the water on the earth right there in that bulb, that's it. That's all the oceans, the glaciers, the groundwater, everything over there in that little ball of, of water sitting next to Earth. And that little speck to the right is all of our fresh water. That's it. And as Maud said, the Earth keeps generating that every single year, but boy, is it precious stuff. And for us to work the way we do, you've gotta take that little bit of fresh water and sprinkle it in just the right places at just the right times and just the right amounts or we don't survive. Okay, we collapse. The history's shown that to be the case. All right, so what's the message here? Well, we've heard a lot about technologies today, and with our technology, uh, you know, we can see into the uh, almost infinity with our telescopes. You can see the edges of the universe. And with our microscopes, you can see down to the very basic building blocks of matter. That's pretty amazing. You can speed up continents and watch India collide with Asia, and it's great, you can watch mountains grow. That happens incredibly slowly. Or you can stop a, a, a raindrop or a lightning bolt and walk around it in 3D. That's amazing stuff. But there's a quote by Marcel Proust, Proust sorry, that I really like. It says, the true voyage of discovery and exploration is not so much in, having new, uh, in, uh, in seeking new landscapes. It's not so much all that poking around. It's in having new eyes. And in this case, I think we have enough evidence to look at our planet and start thinking about it differently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bravo. Thanks, Moses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. When you think about this as a water planet, there's hardly any water at all on, on Earth. And it was just one of those days where we're sitting around saying, um, wait a minute, how much water is really on this planet if we're, we're also running out of water? If, if you had a basketball, uh, all, the, all the ocean water fits into a ping pong ball. So you got to sp imagine sprinkling a, a ping pong ball of water around a basketball. It's hardly any at all. Yeah. Basically, hardly gets it wet.
and then the fresh water is the size of a peppercorn. 